me today. Can we start? This, this is a, another message, and we have one more next Sunday in this series called My Church, The Church Jesus Calls Mine. On this rock, I will build my church, Jesus said, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Hallelujah. Now, let me just say, as of today, we are changing from series to collections of talks. This is the new hip way of saying a sermon series. As you know, series comes from television. As you know, television is on the way out. We'll probably be done in five years. Everything's going internet, Netflix, Apple, Hulu. All, I mean, so the new term is a collection of talks. Today, we are in the third of four collection of talks. We're going to pray and ask God to help us. Lord, use this message today to talk to your people, I pray, in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This week, our own Kilton, John Vier, went on the street to ask people what their purpose is in life. In fact, the team went all the way down to Brickell. Oh, man, some high-rise activity in Brickell. And look what Kilton found this week. Watch the screens if you would. We're here in the heart of Brickell at the business district asking different people what they feel like their purpose is in life. So come on. <laughs> All right, so what do you feel like your purpose is? Um, I would probably say family. So my purpose is absolutely to do something that adds value to our community. Um, I have a startup and it's exactly that. We add value to community, we add value to people. So anything that gives back, that has a give back factor is something that I would love to do and I continue to do and pursue every day and it's why we're here. My purpose in life is to make my own leave it to beaver. I'm part of a generation where a lot of our parents got divorced and we didn't have that. We kind of grew up with that. And that's why I wake up in the morning and go to work and try to make a life for me and my wife. Uh, well, my purpose in, in life is, is to be a, a good musician. Yes, I really play piano, guitar, drums. I'm a music teacher in my country, in Chile. Yeah, so I really would like to, do, to make something here uh, teaching music or installing my own school of music. That's my dream. Yeah. I really still have to know what I want to do when I grow up. Yeah. Even if I am 43, I'm very confused about them. I feel like my purpose is to try to make the world like a better place a little bit at a time every day and see how I can do that. To fulfill my dreams. Uh, go. I don't know. <laughs> I think my purpose here is to have a family, to grow a family, and to care for the people I love. My purpose in life, it's pretty simple. Do no harm, do good, and be remembered. Just bring something to the rest of the humanity. So be part of something big or small, but bring my bricks on the building. I think I'm still in the works of it, so I've made the initial stages to actually want to learn and like know about it, but I'm not there yet. Yeah. Awesome. Since I was a little kid, I just wanted to help people because I want to become a doctor. So I think my purpose is li in life is just to help as many people as I can and, and make their, their life a little bit better, worth living, you know. As long as I can do that, I think I, I, I did my part. Well, there you have it, Trinity Church. Some people don't know what their purpose is. Some people feel like they're here just to make the world a better place. But no matter what that is, we all have this deep desire inside of us or this feeling inside of us that we're here to contribute to something larger than ourselves. But until next time, I love you guys. Man, wasn't that great? Thank you so much, Kilton. 
He's in the youth meeting right now, but man, he's a wonderful part of our church staff. Um, today, I want you to look again with me to Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 7, where God speaks to the people of Israel through the prophet Moses and says, Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. Please look with me again this week to the four I wills of that promise from God. He says in Exodus 6, 6 and 7, I will free you <clears throat> from oppression. I will rescue you from slavery. I will redeem you with a powerful arm and great acts of judgment. And I will claim you as my people and I will be your God. Um, we are, as you know, at the end of the season of atonement next Sunday, we will receive um, the atonement offering that we've done for 15 years in a row. But if you'll remember, this past Easter is also the season of Passover. And at the Passover meal, as I've been telling you each week, Jewish families would gather together in their home and they would celebrate the four cups of the Passover meal. These were cups of wine. And the first one was the cup of sanctification or salvation. The second one was the cup of deliverance. Today, I want to talk about this third cup, the cup of redemption. And it's where we find and discover purpose for our life because God said I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment the cup of purpose of redemption we're going to discover our purpose today by the help of the Holy Spirit when I was working on this message this week, I remembered that old song that some of us used to sing. I say some of us because some of you aren't quite as ancient as I am as I speak to you today. So you never heard the song. But as a little chorus, we used to sing, um, I, he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt. I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Thank God for Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. That's what it means to be redeemed. It means that Jesus redeemed us with a debt that he took care of that I could not pay. Uh, people have often said he brought me out of the miry clay. But I like to say he bought me out as well. He paid what I could not pay. Redemption literally means that God enables us to do what we're supposed to be doing. Some people were born for something, but they've gotten off track. The devil's lied to them, buried them, and they've lost their purpose for living. And redemption brings you back to your purpose. Look at scripture. Ephesians 2 and verse 10 says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, I, yesterday, this past week, I've had the privilege, I, I preached uh, on Wednesday and Thursday in Chicago, Illinois, and then Friday morning flew to Colorado Springs, and I was invited to speak uh, yesterday morning 
um, at the headquarters for every home for Christ. Every home for Christ was formed in 1952, and it was their desire, felt the leadership at that time, that in time they would touch every home on the planet with the good news of Jesus Christ. Today they have 8,500 on their staff worldwide, their paid staff. They have 65,000 missionaries around the world. It started in 1952. That's a long time ago. That's when I was born. And the gentleman who has led that ministry for 30 years, we were celebrating he and his wife's 30th year as the leaders of that organization. His name is Dick Eastman. For those of you that are into prayer material, uh, through the years, he has written prayer classics like No Easy Road and The Hour That Changes the World. Uh, much of our Wednesday noon prayer meetings is taken from his teachings. And this man and his wife are now 74 years of age. So at the age of 44, they took over leadership of this organization. Dick told the story this weekend, I was there Friday night when he shared the story, that when he was 17 years of age, he was lost, he was broken, he, he didn't know what to do with his life, he was miserable with his life, and just kind of buried, not doing well in school, high school, floundering, not many friends, and a woman came up to him. And of course, when you're 17 and a 27-year-old woman comes up to you and talks to you, you think she's 100. I'm just telling you how young people think. So this woman was only 27. I know that because she's 84 now and she was at this event. And she walked up to Dick Eastman and barely knew him. And she said something, you know, the Lord spoke to me, Dick. And he's telling me that you have completely lost your purpose. You don't even know what your purpose is. And if you'd give your life over to God, Jesus would help you discover purpose in life. And it'll be life-changing for you. And her words were so impactful in his life that he went with a friend that weekend to church and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. When that happened, all of a sudden he found purpose and everything turned turned around in his life. His grades went from solid D's to A's from that point on for the rest of his life. He has several uh, honorary doctorates and is working on an earned doctorate. And, and, and God began to use him. He went to North Central University to study for the ministry uh, way back. And there he met his bride-to-be, Dolores, and they got married. And they've been married for 50 years or more. And uh, when he uh, met Dolores, he was praying one night. He was like 19 or 20 years of age, and he was praying, and God said, I want to use you, and you are going to reach. More people are going to find Christ through your ministry than have accepted Christ through the ministry of Billy Graham. Folks, this was 100 years ago. He was like 19, and he thought he was hearing weird stories in his brain as he was praying. His wife, Dolores, worked at the Billy Graham Center in Minneapolis. For all of Billy Graham's ministry, his headquarters, even though he lived in North Carolina, was in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Dolores worked at the Billy Graham ministry. And so Dick had this huge esteem for Billy Graham. And when God told him that, he said, you got to be kidding. He said, this can't be God. And he said, well, Lord, am I going to preach? He goes, no, you're not going to preach like that. He said, prayer is going to open the door for millions to be saved through your ministry. That week, he showed me. I was there. I got in there about 12 o'clock, 1230 on Friday afternoon. And I went to Dick's house house and he showed me his prayer closet he has prayed since he was a 20 year old young man he's now 74 he's prayed every day for one hour a day in this prayer closet and it's just jammed it's real small with all kinds of bible verses and chapters from the bible and he, he said rich you know when i got ordained in 1971 now, to give you some idea, Pastor Rob and I were married in 1973. To give you some idea, Trinity Broadcasting Network was not yet 
uh, even wasn't, it never started until 1973. This was 1971. There was no internet to speak of then. Uh, there just was no Christian TV at that time. In 1971, at his ordination, he prayed for God to give him a miracle. And he gave me his ordination card with the prayer underneath it. Let me show it to you. I took a, a picture of it. Now, it's hard for you to see the prayer underneath, but let me just tell you what a piece of it says at the end. And for those of you that don't believe, you can come and I'll show you on my phone. You'll be able to read it. But the last part of it says, now he's 1971. He's 27 years of age. He says, Lord Jesus, in my life, help me win 100 million people to faith in Christ. That was a stupid prayer in 1971. In Billy Graham's ministry, the people that came forward in his meetings to fill out cards was under 3 million people all over the world. He's praying for 100 million souls. They reported at this event this week where I was speaking, they reported that four years ago, every home for Christ worldwide has seen 100 million people accept Christ as their personal Savior in every language around the globe. But here's something even more exciting. It takes an organization that's highly skilled to be able to get people on the ground Four years since that time, in just four years, 104 million more people have come to faith in Christ. 204 million people since 1971. Now, church, if you would see Dick Eastman, he is the most unlikely person on the planet for this to happen. Every one of you in this room is 10 times cooler than him including you, Pastor Dave. I'm just saying. It's shocking. Why? Because one man found his purpose. He had a little woman say to him, if you would just know Jesus, he would help you discover your purpose. And once he did, boom, everything changed. You know, friends, I believe the first way that God helps us discover our purpose, is that he redeems us with an outstretched arm. In fact, in Psalm 18, verse 35, David says, you stoop down to make me great. Now, picture this with me. Uh, some of you in this room are parents, and you're thinking of your kids. My wife and I, by the way, would you pray for Pastor Robin? She and Carolina are in Brazil today. They got there on Thursday, and she's been preaching since Friday. She's got her last session tonight in front of 5,000 women. Would you pray that God will help her give her strength? You know, she's just about as old as me. And, you know, we, anyway, I'm just saying pray for Pastor Rob. But Robin and I, over the years, have raised four sons into adulthood. Now, parents, see if you can relate to this. I cannot tell you the number of times that I went out when those boys were little toddlers. How is it that when those kids are little, somehow, it's like there's, I don't know if it's gravity or something that is sucking on their body towards the dirt. I can't tell you how many times I went out in the backyard or in the front, and there's one of my kids just in the dirt, you know, 18 months old, two years old, just covered in dirt, just filth, big smile, looking like this is where it is. Dad, this is where it's happening. And man, I'd read, that's, ain't, that's not where it's happening. Get out of it. And I'd reach down and I'd pull them up, pull them out of the dirt and throw them in the tub. Or they'd be in the high chair, and why is it that the mash, mash sweet potatoes never end up in their mouth? It's on their face. It's in their hair. It's covering their chair. And they're sitting there so excited. They haven't eaten a thing. It's everywhere. And you got to pull them out of that thing. And you got to throw them in the tub. And why? Because they were born for more than dirt. And when God reached down to the 
people of Israel and pulled them out of Egypt, he was saying, I made you for more than just to make bricks for no purpose. Now, if you're a brick maker, that's great if you have purpose in it. But millions of people were slaves and had no purpose to what they were doing. God reached down with a powerful arm and lifted them up by the power of Almighty God. You know, some of you in this room need to realize that discipleship is an important part of our lives. We grow in Jesus Christ. The third part of our mission statement says to teach abundant living. And teaching abundant living is all about discipleship. And some of you just can't figure out why we talk so much about growth track. After the service today, I'll say, as soon as you exit out, if you haven't been through growth track, our leadership training, our discipleship training, there's four classes, 30 minutes a Sunday for four weeks. Jump on today if you haven't been. It's 30 minutes. Growth track. And some of you said, man, I wish you'd stop talking about that. But I'm telling you, you heard Michelle give her testimony. This morning, I got this text from her. She said, Pastor Rich, my little girl, Pasha, has a greeting for you. And Pasha's on the front row with her mom and dad. And I know Pasha. And some of you do, too. And this just came out of nowhere. Trust me, I did not solicit this at all. This blew my mind when I heard this. Listen to Pasha greet me this morning. Good morning, Pastor Rich. How are you? Growth Track is divided in four areas. Know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference. Amen. How do you like that? Amen. <laughs> know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference. And she's on the phone. She's like, she knows I forgot it. She's thinking I forgot. I'm going to help him. He probably forgot it himself. But, but you see, discipleship is not about learning more stuff. It's about discovering and developing the reason why we were created and then living it out. Not just to discover your purpose, but then to live your purpose out. Hallelujah. I thank God that God wants each one of us to discover our purpose. I was a little bit like Dick Eastman. Now, he's eight years older than me, but I remember that when I was 19, uh, excuse me, 18, I was at North Central University like him. He was my hero, so I followed and went to North Central in Minneapolis. And my first year in, in Bible college, I, I pretty much lost out with God. I mean, I, I turned my back on God did what I wanted to do, not what he wanted me to do, thought what I wanted to do would be better than what he wanted me to do, and I forgot what my purpose was. I lost my purpose. I was miserable. I was working nine hours a day. I was going to school seven hours a day. I was sleeping four hours a night. I was miserable. I had lost purpose, had forgotten why I was born on this planet. I was carrying a solid C minus grade point average, falling asleep in class, hated school. I was on a tour with a group of young men and we weren't even living for God and we came home and on a Monday morning, I went over to say hi to my father before I went home and went to bed back at the dorm. And, and as I approached my father's office, I could hear prayer in there. People were praying like you can't believe And listen, between services and I'm in the green room waiting to come out for the next service. I'm telling you in the room next to me, the prayer is so intense by our prayer team. And my feeling is I have people come in. They go, what is that? I go, that's prayer. I go, shut up. They're praying. I mean, I, I want that prayer to be turned up. I want to hear that prayer like never before. Prayer breaks every bondage the devil wants to put on you. We've got prayer teams, people that have found their discovered their purpose is to seek God in prayer and pray the devil out and Jesus in. Hallelujah. But I'm telling you, this woman, these people were praying in my father's office, about 15 people. And I opened the door. And it was Mrs. Joy Dawson, a great woman of God. I'd never met her. 
And she told me that day, I went down to the prayer room with her, and I wasn't even living for God. She said, Rich, if you'll give your life to God, you'll discover your purpose, and you'll never be the same again. And that day, folks, I discovered my God again. I turned my back on everything that was destroying my life, and I began to chase hard after Jesus Christ. I've never looked back to the devil's world ever since then. By God's grace, yes, I have failed the Lord. I have sinned, but I have never looked back. I know my purpose in Jesus. And to look back over my life as to what God God has done is a shocking thing for me. I don't boast. I only boast in the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But to think of what God's done through my life, I absolutely am humbled in his presence. And I am no different than you. You are God's chosen vessel. He has planned you for a reason. And only you can fill that purpose. The other way God promises to redeem us is through mighty acts of judgment. And some of you in the room go, oh, Pastor Rich, so what you're telling me is if I don't yield to God, he's just going to whip me into submission. He's going to have such acts of judgment. He's going to beat me down. No, 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 no. No. (laughs) That is not what I am saying. I'm saying that God redeems us by, first of all, pulling us out of the dirt, rescuing us, throwing us in the tub, getting us cleaned up. Moms and dads, are you there? And then his mighty acts of judgment are not on us. It's on the devil who would like to defeat us. Now, I got a lot of moms in this room and a lot of dads too, but moms are special. I'm telling you, my mom was the sweetest person on the planet until somebody attacked me or one of my sisters. You could step on her, spin on her, but if it was one of us, you better get out of Dodge because she's coming at you with some mighty acts of judgment. Not my boy. You know what I'm talking about, all right? When you've repented, when you've gotten right, mom and dad aren't against you. They're for you. But anybody that tries to mess you up, I'm going to tell you something. You better watch out. God's going to come after that devil and take him down in your behalf every time. You see, if God can't get you out of heaven and into hell, he's going to try to make your life here on this earth as miserable as he can until, he can, until you get to heaven. And I just don't believe that's the way God wants us to live. I believe God wants us to be overcomers on this side of heaven. I believe we want to be victorious on this earth. And in order for that to happen, we've got to let the Lord fight our battles and take the devil out. I'm going to tell this story. Is, can I tell one more story? So, I told these people in college. I preached in Chicago. 4,000 people Wednesday nights, Thursday. And um, flew to Colorado on Friday. I told these people I can speak that conference. There's several speakers. I can speak that. There was 400 crazy wealthy people from around the world who fund this mission of every home for Christ. And I said, I can speak this conference, but I have to be the first one on Saturday because I got to catch a plane out of Colorado Springs at noon so I can get to Houston to get the connection back to Fort Lauderdale. They said, if you'll come, we'll have you on the nine o'clock session that actually started at 930. I Got my session in at 1030. I walked off the stage. People were shouting hallelujah. And Dick jumps up. He goes, Rich has to leave immediately. Uh, Let's keep him in our prayers. And I headed out and got to the airport. I got there at 11. I I was at peace. All right, I was just at peace. And um, 
sat there, you know, and I, then they put, pulled us on the plane. I got on the plane, and I'm sitting on the plane. Oh, my Lord, hallelujah. I felt like I was in heaven because I had uh, about seven hours before I'd actually get home to Miami. I was scheduled to land at 8.30 last night here in Fort Lauderdale, which is a little closer to my house, which is in Dade County, but it's a little lot farther from MIA to my house. So I usually fly in and out of Fort Lauderdale. And so I'm sitting there, and I got seven hours to just, I got so much homework. Oh, dear. Everybody say with me, oh, dear Jesus. Oh, dear Jesus. Oh, anyway, so a lot of, I got a lot of homework, all right? So I'm thinking, oh, I got seven hours. Hallelujah. And so we're sitting there, and I'm kind of already writing. You know, I've got my, I know I'm going to have to pull my desk thing up, but I'm writing. And, and finally, the time to take off comes and goes. About 15 more minutes, we're sitting there. And finally, the, the captain comes on the, and he says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I got some bad news. Uh, the uh, airport airport in Houston is shut down. They have closed the airport because of weather. I'm going to ask you to get off the airplane, gather your goods, get off the airplane, and it'll be a minimum two hours before we leave here. Please exit as soon as I'm, I'm oh, God, Jesus. And so I get off the airplane. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, the way, you know, I've been traveling all my life, so, so I'm thinking the, the future. I'm thinking future. I'm thinking two hours makes me miss the connection for sure in Houston into Fort Lauderdale. So I called our PA and I said, hey, Teresa, you got to get this thing worked out. I said, right away, I said, you know, the customer service outside, when I got off the plane, there was about 700 people in line. I mean, I couldn't have gotten through that customer service line before the return of Christ. I prom- It was a terrible line. And so I, I said, Teresa, you got to get me another flight out of Houston. We will get to Houston by the grace of God. But you could take, hey, whatever the latest flight from Houston into Miami is, I'll take a flight and forget Fort Lauderdale. She said, I'm on it. She got on it. And a little while later, there's people all over they're upset people are cursing and they're upset and, and Teresa goes you got the seat there was one seat left uh, on the flight you'll get it at midnight I said okay thank God praise God so I'm sitting down for two hours now and during the two hours it dawns on me I'm gonna get it at midnight MIA that's great I gotta preach three times tomorrow I'm a hundred <laughs> by the time I get home it'll be 1 30 by the time I get the luggage in and get everything packed and hop in the bed, two o'clock. That's exactly what happened. And I'm sitting there, start, start, you know, like, oh, this is so bad. Oh, poor, poor me. Oh, oh dear. Look, oh, God, how could you? How, now, now it's God's fault, not the devil's fault. God, you know, I should have been rebuking the devil. But God, how could you? How could you? And all of a sudden, God clicked something on in my mind. And I heard all things work together for good to those who love the Lord. I heard the verse come up. The steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. I remember getting out of that seat in that lousy coffee shop and looking at the devil say, you're defeated. What you meant for bad, God's going to turn around for good. I'm going to have the greatest services in my life tomorrow. In that 1130 service, people are going to be shouting me down when I get to this point. And I said, hey, I'm going to win because Paul said, we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair. Hallelujah. Persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Why? Because he has a mighty arm with great acts of judgment against the enemy of our souls. And in the final analysis, church, we win. We win. We win. You see, God has given you a purpose that only you can fill. And there was a talent that was given to one of the men in the New Testament. Three stewards Two invested the talents their master gave them. The other one got upset and buried their talent because he was afraid of the master who had blessed him. The question I have today is what will you do with your gift? What will you do, church, with your talent? Will you bury your talent for fear? Or instead, will you bury your fear and invest your talent? You know, the Bible talks in 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7, about the nine gifts of the Spirit. But in Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, Paul gives us seven gifts that 
Many leaders call the seven motivational gifts of God. In other words, one of these motivations motivates everything you do in your life. At one time or another, you'll have probably each one of these seven gifts operating in your life at some time or another. But one of the seven is your foundational motivational gift. And they are mercy, preaching or prophecy, serving, teaching, exhortation, giving, and administration. I love my friend, Pastor Rick Warren, illustrated these seven motivational gifts this way. He said, let's say someone was having dinner. Seven family members. Each family member had a different one of the seven motivational gifts. And at the end of the meal, tables being cleaned, and dessert is being served. This never happens in my home. I just, this is an illustration. Imagine. And while dessert is being served, one of the children or young people, drops the dessert on the floor and it crashes to the floor. Ah! Challenge! Ah! What do we do now? Now listen, here's how the seven gifts operate. Are you ready? We got a dessert crashed on the floor, seven people at the table. Mercy says, don't feel bad. It could happen to anyone. Preaching says, that's what happens when you're not careful. Hallelujah. <laughs> Serving says, let me help clean it up. Teaching says, the reason it fell is because it was too heavy on one side. Exhortation says, next time let's serve the dessert with the meal. Hallelujah. Giving says, I'll buy, I'll be happy to buy you a new dessert. And the administrator says, Jim, would you get a mop? Sue, pick things up if you would. Mary, help me fix another dessert. These are gifts. What happens if one of those gifts isn't at the table? What happens if three of those folks failed to discover their purpose? Somebody told me, you know, Pastor Rich, I have the, the ministry of helps or encouragement. I don't know where that's going to take me. Let me tell you, I know multi-millionaires whose foundational gift is helping. And because they helped, God opened doors that no one could have opened for them. Today, it's imperative that we discover our purpose. Today, it's imperative that you take the cup of redemption and drink it deeply so that in time God shows you your purpose. I want you to bow your head with me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I wonder how many in this room, and I must do this quickly. I've gone too long today, but I wonder how many would just say, Pastor Rich, <sighs> I kind of feel like you when you were 18 years old and you'd lost your way. You'd lost your purpose, your reason for being and you were just kind of going through the days miserable and pastor rich today uh, I, I've, i'm so far away from where i know i need to be i need god's forgiveness today i want to get back on track i want to discover my purpose pastor would you please include me in your final prayer today i need god's forgiveness if that's you and you'd like for me to include you in my final prayer. You need to be forgiven. Here on this main floor, this bottom floor, I want you to raise your hand right now, quickly. If you want me to pray, raise it real high. I see yours and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours and yours. What about this middle section? I see yours and yours there as well. There, 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 there. Yes, yes, yes. Thank God. Thank God. In the back, I see yours and yours as well. God bless you. You can put it down. My left, your right. I see your hand and I see your hand over on this side. Anybody else at all on this side? Raise your I see yours. I see yours, ma'am. You can put it down. I'm, I see yours right there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What about 
What about the bleacher section over the bleach? Anybody in the bleachers, please pray. I see yours and yours and yours there. God bless your heart for your honesty today. Anybody in the overflow, raise it real. I see people in the overflow raising their hands. God bless your hearts. I love you so much. I'm going to give you five more seconds. Anyone, you haven't raised your hand, but God's call. I need to get right with God. Raise it up real high. I'll wait five more seconds. Four, three, two, one god bless your heart i see your hand right there stand to your feet with me everyone's standing and we're going to sing this little chorus i've seen you move you move the mountains and on the first word of this song as you stand on the first word of this song i've seen you move if you raised your hand today for me to pray that god would bring forgiveness I'm going to ask on the first word of this song that you step from where you are, the bleachers, the main floor, the overflow. Step from where you are. Come and stand with me at this altar. Let me pray with you personally before I bless you all. You say, Pastor, I can't do that. People will see me. That's the whole point. There's something about walking away from where you work to where you want to be in Jesus that will make all the difference. You come as we sing it right now. Come. I see you move. You move the mountains, and I believe, I see you do it again. You made a way, where there was no way, and I believe, I see you do it again. I see you move, you move the mountains, and I believe, I see you do it again. You made a way when there was no way And I believe I see it to me Wow, wow, wow. Is this great? Look at these families coming. Hallelujah. How you doing, Dad? I love you so much. God bless you. God bless you. What a response. God bless you, sweet. Hi, how you doing, Mama? She, she, she's going, is he talking to me? I am talking to you. Give me a little handshake there if you would. I love you so much. Hallelujah. Hey, listen, we're going to pray the prayer of faith right now. Prayer changes things. I can't change you. You can't change me. But God can change us. I want everybody to reach your hands in the direction of this altar. Let's pray the prayer of faith. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every man. I need some folks coming in real close here and just standing with my friends on this front row. Would you come in real close? Put a hand on their shoulder. Let them feel the love of God right now. Lord, I pray in this moment, Lord, sin would go. Failure would go and God's victory would take his place. God's forgiveness would take his place. I thank you, Lord, for men and women who are honest before God today. I thank you, Lord, that right now forgiveness is flowing from heaven's throne into every heart and life right now. I want everybody at this altar and everybody in this room to pray this prayer out loud, real loud with me right now. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus I've, sinned. I've sinned. I'm not proud of, it, not proud of it, but I admit it. I admit today, it. Today, today, I lay my sin down. I lay my sin down. Take it, I pray. Pray. Take it, I, pray. I don't want it anymore. I, want it anymore. I, reach, to heaven I reach to heaven to receive your forgiveness, to, receive your forgiveness. to take the place of my sin. I ask that you would accept me, you Jesus, accept me Jesus, in your wonderful family. Wonderful family. Today, Today, I give my life, give my life completely, to you. completely to you. I'm yours, Lord. I'm yours, Lord. Thank, you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, church, put your hands together for these precious men and women.